David Bernstein, founder of the Jewish Institute for Liberal Values. Um, happy to do this uh, podcast, webcast with the Speech Project of the Jewish Journal. And today our guest is Rebecca Royfe. Rebecca is a professor at New York Law School. Um, she's written extensively about issues of democracy and liberalism. I'll let her talk more about that. Um, she was also a signatory of the quote unquote Jewish Harper's Letter. And um, of course I recognize the last name Royfe because Katie is also well known and uh, thought it would be just a great opportunity to ask you, what made you sign that letter? I have grown increasingly worried about the nature of public discourse and, you know, people call it cancel culture. And I think that is um, only capturing a small segment of it. I think there's a closing down of debate rather than an opening up of debate using words like um, racism um, to stop conversations, calling people racist or calling ideas racist uh, in a way to stop conversation rather than to engage. And I think it has ended up with a deadening of um, ideas and discourse and understanding. And, um, you know, I think that's problematic. And I think there's also been an excessive focus um, on the left on, on certain kinds of identities and how those um, define people well, absolutely. And I think that is counterproductive and destructive. I, I think there's, you know, I'm, a, I'm also a trained historian, and I think there's some truth to the fact that people's identities shape them. But I think we can take this to an extreme that is both disturbing and um, reductive in a way that's just really, um, it, it, it's, it, it really um, will create more problems than it will solve. Hmm. So, um we, we spoke a little bit of before this that uh, you, your, your, your mom is a well-known thinker, writer. Um, can you share anything about what it was like to grow up in a family of, of scholars who talk about issues and how might that have molded your current thinking today, if it has? Um, absolutely. So my mom is not only... Um, a uh, writer um, who is deeply attached to her Jewish identity. She is also somebody who um, isn't afraid to pick a fight. <laughs> um, you know, she has strong ideas, but you know what she also is like really to her credit, she's somebody who will change her ideas when she thinks she's wrong. So I remember very vividly um, growing up and we used to have a Christmas tree um, when I was little and she wrote this article, like a puff piece for the times about Jews having Christmas trees. And she got like hate from both sides. Like Christians mm. were mad. Why are you, you know, like cheapening our holiday Jews, <laughs> everybody was mad. And she was, and she thought about it and she decided she was wrong. Um, and, you know, we stopped having a Christmas tree and we started celebrating Hanukkah and really um, embracing our Jewish identity much more than we had before. And I think both of those are values that I grew up with, both, um, you know, standing by your position, strongly articulating your position, even when people disagree with you forcefully, and even when it can result in some kinds of sometimes social ostracization and all of that, but also to be open and thoughtful and willing to change your ideas when somebody somebody else has ideas that are better or or you, you're you convinced. And so I think that both of those things are at play here that one has to be strong to stand up to the tide right now. But part of the tide um, is an anti-openness. And so both of those things are things I really care about and they come um, largely from um, growing up in the house that I grew up in. Hmm. So you've written a lot about democracy and what it takes to protect democracy. And we know that it could be under threat from both the right and the left. Uh, but we're talking here about the critical social justice surge and how it might affect discourse around democracy and how it could erode democratic norms. What are your thoughts on that? Right. You know, I think a lot of times what people say is they think, you know, they say, OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, the threat from the right, you know, January 6th, like the threat from the right is so much bigger. It's so much more. And I don't actually um, think that way. I think that they are um, similar threats um, and they are both they both come from um, a willingness to 
dispense with things that I think are fundamental to human freedom. And um, the, you know, as, as I said, you know, what I work on largely is, um, you know, rule of law values, institutions and values that promote the rule of law, presumption of innocence, due process, and all of those things I think are fundamental. Um, and you, you know what, when they're most at, in jeopardy is when you have to stand up for them, even when, you know, the 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 issue is not one that you particularly um sympathize with so mm -hmm. i think that that's you know that's that's the problem is that you know on both the left and the right there's increasingly a willingness to get rid of process values when the end result is one that you want and to me that's like you know it, it is it's so dangerous to play that game um, right. we saw no, that with the aclu abandon right. its support uh, for certain civil liberties cases because it didn't meet their preconceived notion of, of, of who the victims ought to be. And, um, and they would no longer defend right-wing groups whose civil liberties might be under attack. Right, absolutely. And that's, you know, historically, that's how the, AC, the ACLU grew up doing, um, you know, these sorts of cases that were so, um, so controversial and because of who who they were protecting you know and you know from neo-nazis to the ku klux klan and the reason why they did that is because those values are when it comes down to it you know who those values protect are you know um, minorities marginalized groups it, it, this this illusion that you can momentarily just grab power and run with it like it, it's so a historical, like that's just not the way things work. And the only way, I mean, it's really historically played out that the only way that these groups have any protections are when you stand up for these values, these process values, regardless of whom they're protecting at any given moment. And that, you know, that, that seems in real, it's really being threatened by both the left and the right right now. Mm. So how, in what way does this imposition of ideology, some call it critical social justice ideology, erode these democratic norms? Well, I mean, you know, in in so many ways, I think the you know one of the ways that your that that your letter focused on so well was this um, splitting up of the world into oppressed and oppressor. Um, you know, I think that 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 the world doesn't <laughs> doesn't work that way. You know, and that often you know the oppressed becomes the oppressor, or the oppressed also can behave in an oppressive kind of way. And I think that that um, you know is incredibly damaging and um, ends up making it such that we. Um, um, demonize certain people and certain groups very quickly. Uh, I also think the very narrow, very specific definitions of things like racism um, it, are problematic because they shut down debate. I mean, it's a way mm -hmm. of saying, you know, if you think back to McCarthyist um, uh, America, you know, what people were saying was anytime you, you know, suggested any kind of redistribution or sympathized with any kind of, you know, liberal um, impulse, you yourself were a communist. And it's a way of, of just demonizing and getting rid of instead of engaging with things that are disturbing and upsetting and different. And I think that's really, you know, what's going on right now, um, you know, especially, I think, on the left. And, you know, there, again, there are other problems and other threats coming from the right that I think are, you know, equally concerning. But, you know, this is, this shouldn't be seen as separate. It should see, see, be seen as part of the same impulse to just get, a, get rid of the, these neutral values and neutral institutions, First Amendment, Man, rule of law, due process. Right. You know, I've um, written a bit about this and other people have really commented about where this comes from in the ideology. And in my view, critical social justice ideology has two key components. The first is that racism is embedded in the systems and structures of society. And the second is that only marginalized people, those who are adversely affected by these invisible systems of oppression are able to see that racism and therefore they're the only ones who are really qualified to define it for the rest of society. And what happens is that that's then weaponized in a way that says, if you, pers if you who don't have standing because you're not affected, choose to speak, you have no lived experience and therefore you have no standing to actually participate in that conversation or to have an opinion. 
how do you see that playing out? Do you agree with that assessment that that's what's happening or do you have another way of looking at it? Yes, I think that's absolutely right. I think that this, you know, this notion that um, the sort of lived experience as uh, Trump's fact at, in a way. And I feel like, you know, it's it, it is, you know, something that ends conversation rather than rather than engages in it. And I think that's part of the yes. problem with it. I also think that this um <clears throat> This I- idea that we can't um, c- communicate, you know, that 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 really it is one's essential being. It's also right. extremely condescending in a way that, right. um, you know, a- again, another thing from my background, you know, my 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 mother was a feminist. You know, my 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 sister wrote about, um, you know, date rape, uh, anti date rape culture in the in the 1990s. And I feel like it again. It's like there's only one way to be something. There's only one way to be. You're with us or you're against us. And that is. Um, and and you can only you only know something if you've experienced it. And I and I think you know it's sort of it's anti. It's anti intellectual. It's anti literature. I mean, our, our whole life is you know trying to explain to people and trying to empathize with people and trying to relate our own experience to other people's experience. And I think this notion that you know creating hierarchies and creating hierarchies of who's allowed to speak about certain subjects and you know there's always it's also unfalsifiable because if somebody from that group says something dissenting then you say you know it's false consciousness it would be the old language for it you know it's like i think it's the new um, language for it again as well Right. I mean, you know, it, 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 like what were people called like Uncle Tim, you know, is what they what they said about about Representative Scott. I mean, it it is so dismissive and it's um, and it, it, it eliminates the possibility of somebody having either other relevant experience or um, ideas that are built around, you know, literature, knowledge, you know, that that can transcend experience. And right. so you know, I, I I don't know where this is going, but it's just definitely not going in a good direction from my point right. of view. Yeah, the uh, young African-American thinker Coleman Hughes says that lived experience can be treated as just one data point in a conversation. It, it matters, you know, it matters that I'm Jewish and I've experienced anti-Semitism and taunting and so forth. So I probably have a data point that would be useful if you're interested to know what it's like to experience anti-Semitism. But I also know, by the way, that because of that, I may be more prone to actually exaggerating anti-Semitism in society. So it can be a form of myopia too. It doesn't just open up windows. It also it also can actually blind us in a way to our own reality. And we need to hear from people who can tell us, well, listen, I mean, look at the statistics or look at how much you're admired. Jews are admired in America. So I think all that has to be part of our uh, collective consciousness, if you will, about what kind of racism or anti-Semitism we're experiencing in the world. Right. That's true. And I feel like in the classroom, that's particularly hard these days because, you know, I do think it's actually very useful. I I teach, for instance, like stop and frisk. And I think it's very useful when I have students who have experienced being stopped, um, you know, when they weren't doing anything. And and to, to, to bring that alive is so useful, but that cannot end the conversation. And so frequently the, what I have trouble doing is not getting those people to speak anymore. Those people will speak. I can't get anybody. I I have to voice the other side, which is okay. But you know, how else are we going to get guns off, you know, and, 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 and how else are we going to protect this neighborhood? And that, there, there ought to be a way in which these voices can come together instead of it being a, you know, a situation in which you, you know, you empathize and that's it. That's the end of the story. Right. Right. Yeah. That's, that's a tough one. Um, And it, um, and it's sometimes used to call people uh, privilege too. If you're exercising your privilege by speaking about an issue where it's really time to make space for somebody else. And I think really shuts down, um, the possibility of conversation. But the, the one thing that really hits me about this discourse is it actually stifles social progress because I don't know how you can actually make America a better place if you try to shut down and shut out of the discourse people who are from the majority culture. How is it? What is your vision of creating a more equal society, a fairer society, if a lot of people can't talk? Right. And I think that, you know, what people, what people um, ignore also is what 
what you might call a backlash, but I don't even call it a backlash. I think it's sort of what a kind of the psychological ne psychologically necessary next step, which is if you do that and you force people not to speak, they don't stop speaking. Right. They just take that speech underground and the speech then is not informed by the other side. So I think, you know, part of the problem is what I hear and I've heard from, you know, friends of mine who have, you know, moved, moved fairly far right, you know, sort of frighteningly right recently is it, what, you know, what they say is like, you know, I'm sick of feeling guilty. Like, you know, when you think about it, you know, what, what my culture and that, you know, it's disturbing, right? The white people saying what my culture did, you know, we brought you democracy. We brought you democratic values. We brought you the birth control pill. We brought you, you know, so it's like you start it, this notion of Western chauvinism is in right. part created by if you try to shame people, they're going to start to say, no, 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 wait, right. I have an identity and I'm proud of it. And I don't think you can stop that. Like, I don't think you can say, oh, you have an identity and it only should be infused by guilt. I, I, I don't think that's possible. And so... Um, I'm very concerned by that. And I, and I think we should have learned from 2016 that, you know, this is, this is part of what happens, but instead it was like, a, like a dig, like a digging down, a, dig, a, a digging in a, a further deeper entrenchment, as opposed to an engagement with people who don't necessarily think like us and don't want to be told, you know, it's only a very certain small segment of white men who are just perfectly happy to say, you're right. Like I've had my spot. Like I, I don't deserve this. I should only sit here and feel guilty for my ancestors. And, you know, I, I thought that was great about the letter too, that, that, um, pointing out that, you know, that's antithetical itself to Jewish values. We don't, you know, hold the, you know, father's sins, um, you know, are, are not, are not, are not passed down to the son. And that just seems like that's the best way to make, to improve things. If you are, if you force people in this punitive way to, um, to bear the guilt, sometimes it's not even their ancestors, by the way, but of people who look like them, right. that, you know, that, that's just not, it, even if that's the right thing to do, that is not going to work. Um, I don't think it's the right thing to do, but even if it were, it, it, it's, 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 it's create it's creating a lot of problems. Right. So on a, on a related issue, you know, there's this common way of framing the issue as white supremacy. You're hearing it over and over that America is a white supremacist society. And I also find that problematic. Um, I'm not suggesting that there aren't, there isn't white supremacy in specific institutions in society or that you can find maybe embedded in the criminal justice system in certain places. Um, but at the same time, America, it seems to me, compared to literally everywhere else in the world, is a pretty receptive, welcoming place. And people still flock here from all over the world to live here, brown and black people. Almost all the immigration is not white that comes into this country today. And they're integrated. And yes, it sometimes causes a political backlash, but it also, over time, has proven to be you know, extremely effective. Um, what what is your feeling about that language of white supremacy and how it's being used today? Right, I think it's incredibly problematic, and part for the reason that you suggest, also because I think it um, prevents us from solving real problems. Because you know, it's like if every disparate outcome that you see is caused by white supremacy, then the only response is to scream about white supremacy and tr tell white people to try to be less supremacist, <laughs> to be right. less racist. And um, I don't think that's actually solving any problems, or it's right. solving very few. Because I think. I think the problems are uh, much deeper than that. And, you know, it, you know, I can give you an instance in, in, in my field where it's like, you know, people will say, well, you know, there, the, the, the problem there's a, you know, there's a, there's a wealth gap and um, there's that, there's a housing gap, like more white people own houses for every income bracket than black people. So what we need to do is to give tax benefits to renters. And the problem with that is it gets it all backwards. The problem is not like, why are black people not saving money, right? That's, that's a real right. problem. And I would like to address that problem. That seems concerning to me. I don't believe in, you know, I don't believe that it's because like racially they're encoded not to save money. That makes no sense to me. That's like a Nazi way of thinking. However, I do think sometimes cultures can, it can, you know, develop in a way that's just not productive. And how do we, how do we change that? How do you change behavior? And if you just say, you know, we, 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 
fault the institution. We're just going to keep getting rid of neutral things like a tax benefit for home ownership is meant to be a way to um, reward the signs of people who are doing the things to enter into the middle class. That's a good thing. We want people to move into the middle class and we want to encourage that with our tax system. But um, we don't want to, I mean, it's problematic if we're rewarding white people more than black people, but it won't solve the problem. And right. at every level, this is happening. Instead yes. of solving problems, we're getting rid of the neutral institutions that just simply reflect the problem. They're not the cause of the problem, you know, right. th like getting rid of, you know, th the same thing with schools. Like in New York, there's a big question about the, um, gifted and talented programs and the specialized right. schools. Same here so, in the DC area, by the way, uh, right, Thomas Jefferson right. School, right. Yeah, so it's like, get rid of the school because there aren't enough, you know, African-American students passing the test to get into the school. No, actually fit, go, go help those communities at a very early age so that they are more prepared and can yes. pass the test. Like it's a hard work and it takes a long time and it's not instant you know, gratification because you won't instantly see equality, but that's the only way to fix the underlying problem. Right. And otherwise you're just throwing out good things that ha that right. really, ha I mean, my dad was an immigrant and his parents only spoke Yiddish and he went to his gifted and talented class at his school in Brooklyn. And it's the thing that saved him. So sure. you don't want to get rid of that. Like that's, yeah. that would be terrible. Right. Yeah. So, um, Let's talk about equity for a second and I'll let you go. Okay. Um, the term equity has been revamped by Ibram X. Kendi to mean something I think different than it used to mean. Um, he defines equity as any form of disparity automatically means discrimination and racism. That's number one. So that's sort of the ideological way he looks at it. And number two, it has to be rectified in the here and now. So um, if, there is a dis if there are more white people in a certain profession than black people as a percentage of population, then that means there's discrimination Then we have to rectify that in the here and now. We have to take action that would uh, rectify that. How, what do you think of this new concept that's sort of seeping into our, not just our vocabulary, by the way, but into our social policy? Yeah, I mean, I think it suffers from some of the same problems that I was just suggesting, which is, you know, you then end up with a world in which you have, you may have superficial um, diversity, but you um, are not helping the people who actually need the help. You know, I mean, you don't want to put people in, it's not fair or good or right to put people into positions where they, you know, aren't qualified or don't have, you know, and I'm not suggesting there may be plenty of situations in which there are plenty of people who are qualified, but I think this has moved to a point where we don't even care. It doesn't yeah. matter. Like just a point, just put, you know, regardless. And um, I don't think that's doing them a favor and it's certainly not doing, you know, our, our, you know, the institutions themselves a favor. And it's a real terrible, awful problem, but it takes a long time to work on right. that. You need, a, you need a, yeah, you need a, um, you need a long-term strategy um, to be able to bring people. So if there's science institutions that have uh, too few African-Americans, maybe it's 5% or 4%. Yeah. The goal is to make sure we teach STEM in inner city schools and get more people out of poverty and, and, and have more scientists in the long term, not, not right. to try to artificially rectify that in the here and now where you're bringing people in who are not necessarily qualified. And by the way, you're also creating victims, people who had jobs in these institutions that were uh, that are now being displaced by people who are less qualified than them. And I think that's problematic as well. Right, right, totally. And I feel like part of the problem also is this notion that, you know, if you talk about culture, that that's like taboo and that you're blaming the really victim. And I don't think that's true at all. I mean, you know, I think that there are things, you know, for instance, I think I think Jewish people needed to work on, you know, th that that the Holocaust was was traumatic and it created a lot of problems. And, sure. you know, and you, the Jewish people need to look look inward and think like, it's not our fault. You know, we're bearing scars for, you know, the sins of other people for sure. But it, but nobody else is, nobody else can help us. We need to right. figure out a way to do that. And I, and I, 
you know, I think that's much more empowering language too, to, you know, say yes. like it, it, it isn't blaming the victim. It's saying, you know, it's, 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 it's demeaning to say you're in a situation where it's only our magnanimity. Like it's only us. We're the only ones who can, you know, out of the kindness of our hearts, give you something that will change your fate and change your, um, change your world. In fact, no, there are lots of ways. And of course, this general society should help. But the idea that it that that's that that's the one solution, the one problem and the one solution is so it's just factually incorrect. And it's not going to solve any problem. It's not, you know, the, um, the African American thinker and writer john wood wrote a great piece in Aereo magazine about this. Um, and he said, Look, there's a there, he calls it the pivotal irony of racism. He said, you know, you had slavery, of course, which stripped uh, black people have an identity, a cultural identity. So that new identity formed under conditions of slavery. And then you had uh, Reconstruction and you had Jim Crow. And then the manufacturing sector collapses where a lot of black families got their wealth. And it's understandable that there would be a tremendous legacy of racism from all that, even after the civil rights um, era was over, that that's going to leave a scar and it's going to leave a cultural imprint on on many African Americans. Now, it so happens that two thirds of African Americans now live in the middle class or above, and that's wonderful. But we know we have this inner city, and that that you, if you dismiss cultural factors and you dismiss the problems of of crime in the inner city because you're so focused just on the smattering of police shootings that takes place every year. I mean, again, we should solve those problems, but if you dismiss that because you're crowding it out of the discourse because it's deemed racist to have that conversation, then you don't actually deal with a much larger problem that, um, that is plaguing the inner city and that has to be solved ultimately from the inner energy of the communities. Uh, and that's really tragic. Um, and I think people who are trying to dismiss that as racism or um, or say you can't cite cultural factors for um, why the world is the way it is are actually doing a tremendous disservice to the people who are most adversely affected by those cultures. At the very least engage, you know, I mean, like my view is like, OK, you know, maybe I'm wrong. I, right. I, I'm open. But like the, the really just getting back to your letter, the scary thing is like not just that I don't just I don't agree with this worldview. It's that this is a worldview that's blocking out other worldviews and unwilling to talk. Yes. And it's like if you're so convinced you're right, then it shouldn't be a threat. Like then, you know, convince me. Right. Let's talk about it. And instead, I, you know, it's so um, it's so, you know, you mentioned Coleman Hughes. It's like he's never mentioned. I mean, he's, he, he, you know, the, the, you, you can't hear include Robin, him in a discussion. No, you hear Robin D'Angelo, you hear, you know, Ibram X. Kendi, you hear those names and you never hear him. And it's like, right. I don't I, I don't understand that. Like, at least that is a thoughtful, valid viewpoint and right. engage with it. And, you know, I mean, I'm at the moment, I'm more sympathetic to that viewpoint, but I, the main right. thing here, just to get back to the beginning is like, you don't have a monopoly on this problem. There are other people who really have the same goal as you really good people. Right. And they just think there's a different way to get there. So talk to those people and see if you can't, you know, or see if you can't take your strongest positions and you know, let's work, some, you know, where, right. where we meet, you know. I, I, I might be able to be convinced that there's more systemic racism than I see now if you're engaging with me and talking right. about your experience in a way that's not delegitimizing of my own perspectives. Right. You're opening up my eyes to things that I might not have seen before. Totally. I do believe that there's a possibility and there is actually oppression embedded in systems. And I think I can come up with examples in my own life where I saw that mm -hmm. and I thought of things that other people might not have been able to see. So yeah. I'm not closed off to that, but I don't think it can possibly be the only explanatory re factor for why we have where we what we have the disparity in the world. Right. Um, look, this has been fascinating. Um, you're such an important voice, and I think it needs to be amplified on this. I'm so grateful that you took the time to talk, and I hope it will not be the last time we are able to have a conversation like this. Um, and um, thank you so much. Rebecca. Thank you. Thank you. And, and by the way, I should just say congratulations again on that letter. I thought it was so well written and the organization seems great. So I'm looking forward to seeing more of your work.